Um, good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'm uh, Beth Miller. I'm from Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, uh, which is part of SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in California in the United States. Um, today, I will be sharing my work on uh, the spectrum microscopy of lithium silver batteries. So the morning sessions really set the stage quite wonderfully for, um, for my talk. So as we all know, lithium sulfur has great potential, but it also has a lot of uh, stumbling blocks in terms of its uh, capacity fade, and there's a lot that isn't known about the mechanisms of failure in lithium sulfur. Um, so the critical point of this work is obtaining a spatially resolved map of uh, lithium sulfur battery operando, so as it's cycling. Um, so I'm using X-ray absorption spectroscopy to uh, determine which sulfur species are present during cycling at different states of charge. And whoo, okay, there was a thing on there, I apologize. Um, and to resolve sulfur spatial distribution across the uh, electrolyte and in the electrodes. Um, in the top schematic, you can see sort of what I mean by this. Um, so instead of doing a typical characterization, I'm going to be focusing on cross-sectional uh, imaging of lithium sulfur batteries. And in the bottom uh, is a schematic of a lithium sulfur battery. We are interested in the species that are present in the separator and the electrolyte, but also the surface films uh, that form on the anode and the cathode. So I did all of my work at Beamline 14.3 at uh, SSRL, um, which is the, the synchrotron at SLAC. Uh, Beamline 14.3 is a X-ray microprobe in the tender X-ray regime, which is about 2100 EV to 5000 EV. Above that, you have what are called hard X-rays. Below that, you have soft X-rays. And in the tender sort of squishy range uh, in between, it makes me think of like a, like a nice steak, you know, tender, well done X-rays, rare X-rays. Um, and what's unique about this beam line is we have a very small spot size. It's a five micron spot size. Um, so we can get very high spatial resolution. And we also have a helium sample environment uh, to prevent X-ray absorption from the air. Um, all of my experiments uh, are done in the sulfur K edge, which is 2472 EV. Um, this is the energy that's required to eject a 1s electron of a sulfur atom. Uh, the shape and uh, position of the resulting spectra indicate the bonding environment of the sulfur atoms in your material of interest. And this is a schematic on the left-hand side of what the sample setup looks like. Um, so the x-ray beam comes in, it's your sample, and then the outcoming beam uh, goes into a fluorescence detector. Uh, and this is a schematic of uh, what the beamline itself actually looks like. And your sample sits where that red arrow is right there. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, conventional pouch cell geometry. You have your uh, polyester or other uh, polymer uh, pouch, and then you have your sulfur carbon electrode, your lithium anode uh, separator. We use beryllium windows, which are x-ray transparent, uh, to apply pressure. And your x-ray beam comes in uh, and comes out, like in the previous schematic. And this is great. Pouch cells are pretty easy to make. Um, but what they actually give you is an average of all the chemistry through the layers. So you lose that spatial resolution that's uh, especially important in lithium sulfur batteries. Um, so the area of interest uh, between the two electrodes in the separator um, is what we really care about. So we're actually going to take this pouch cell geometry that we're very familiar with and turn it on its side, literally. Uh, so my first attempt at answering the question of uh, the spatially resolved uh, sulfur species in lithium sulfur batteries was I used a cross-sectional pouch cell. Uh, this is a schematic on the bottom of uh, the area of interest and what you would see if you were looking at the pouch cell uh, as if you were an x-ray. So the x-ray comes in and it goes uh, to the area between your two uh, electrodes, comes out. Uh, we have a very thin pouch to get maximal x-ray uh, penetration. Um, this was also uh, I used a lithium perchlorate electro electrolyte in uh, dull DME with lithium nitrate. This way, any sulfur signal that I detect, I know comes from the electrode and not from an LITFSI salt, for example. Uh, the cathodes that I used uh, in this and in the other uh, case I'm going to be presenting were uh, made by Brian Perdue at Sandia, Sandia National Laboratories. Um, so this is a 68% sulfur 
uh, carbon PVDF electrode, and then lithium foil and cell guard separator. So I'm going to be talking about multi-energy mapping of X-ray absorption near edge, near edge structure, or zines. Um, this is an example of a standard spectrum. I think I took this from the ESRF website. Um, so when you collect data of this nature, you have your normalized absorption on the y-axis. So it's basically a measure of uh, how much of the X-ray is absorbed. Then you have your energy on the x-axis. And depending on the location and the intensity of your signal, you can understand what kind of species you are looking at in your battery. And if you select particular energies, they correspond to different oxidation states and therefore different species in your battery. So I'm interested in the polysulfides. So that's a pre-edge feature at 2470.3. We have uh, S8, which is uh, the sulfur edge. Um, and then we also have other species uh, like sulfates um, higher order Li2S peaks, things like that. So focusing on two of those energies in the cross-sectional pouch cell, this was sort of our proof of concept. So uh, we have differences in sulfur intensities um, and also in Li2S intensities as we're discharging. Um, on the bottom are just the reference spectra to remind you of the energies that I'm talking about. Um, and this was great. This was our proof of concept. We can actually see sulfur, which is not trivial. Um, and we can get a spatially resolved picture. But as many of you probably know, if you've ever made a pouch cell, it's really hard to make the same exact pouch cell over and over again. Um, and getting very repeatable results can be somewhat tricky. Um, so that led me to design a uh, more robust cell um, that has a better defined geometry so that I can uh, actually uh, repeat the experiment and compare apples to apples. Um, so I used the same lithium perchlorate system. Uh, and then I used uh, cathode, which is sort of the next generation um, sulfur uh, super P carbon nanotube PEO LITFSI that we're using in J. Caesar. Um, lithium foil again, and a glass microfiber separator to maximize the amount of area in the electrolyte. Um, this is a schematic of the, the cross-sectional cell. I'm using a one millimeter silicon nitride window as my field of view, so I can get a very large field of view. And then on the right-hand side, you can see kind of the, the innards of the cell. Uh, I build the battery directly into the cross-sectional cell and have two uh, current collector screws on either side. Um, this is all assembled, and then the electrolyte is added uh, after the fact. This is an example of the electrochemistry uh, for the maps that I'm going to show you. Um, I was able to get three discharge charge cycles. Um, they're shown in kind of rainbow order, so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Um, and then when I mapped, I took uh, time points at every, about every hour and a half. Um, as you can imagine, taking a map is not an instant thing, so there is a bit of a time gradient in the maps, um, but I will talk about that when I actually see, or when I actually show you the maps. Um, so in the interest of time, because I don't want to show you 18 maps of every energy, it's a lot of maps, um, I'm going to focus on the first discharge. So uh, the initial state, the end of the first discharge, uh, the two points on the first charge, and then the final state of the electrode. So this is at the polysulfide energy, so 2470.35. Uh, on the left-hand side is the initial state of the electrode. Uh, to kind of give you an idea of what you're actually seeing here. There's a schematic underneath. So on the left-hand side, you have the sulfur carbon electrode. Uh, we have the separator, the lithium foil, and then uh, the extra space on the side is the silicon nitride uh, window and frame. So uh, most of the information you'll want to look at is on the left-hand side. Uh, at the end of the first charge, uh, you can see that the polysulfide signal has increased, which is expected as we're discharging. Um, we also have these sort of discontinuity um, features. These are real. If you look in the uh, I1, uh, the intensity of the incoming beam, it is uninterrupted. And if you normalize by that energy, those effects are still there. Um, so this leads me to believe that on the 15 micron step uh, scale of these maps, there are some things that are happening that are happening at a, a uh, time scale and maybe even a size scale that is uh, not adequately captured by the maps, but this will be in the future directions, which I'll hit on at the end. Um, so then 
if you look to the end of, or excuse me, the beginning of the first charge, um, we have that discontinuity still present. Um, our polysulfide intensity is starting to decrease. And then at the end of the first charge, we have pretty much a complete recovery of the intensity throughout um, the electrode, but we also have uh, some residual intensity of the polysulfides. This is a, a map taken at uh, the sulfur edge, so S8. You can see kind of the same sort of evolution with the discontinuity as we uh, discharge and charge. Again, we have a full recovery of uh, the signal at the end of the first charge. Um, also, the intensities have uh, changed a bit, and you can see that sort of time element um, that I mentioned uh, going from bottom to top. Um, this becomes less obvious uh, in the subsequent cycles, but it's also something that I'm going to be uh, optimizing in the future work. And I mentioned that we're using a PEO LITFSI binder, so we can also track uh, the sulfonyl uh, excuse me, sulfonimide groups in the LITFSI, which appear around 2480.6 EV. Uh, again, we have the discontinuities and the changes uh, during the first discharge and charge um, with the recovery uh, at the end of the second charge. So this is the final electrode structure. So what we're looking at here are three maps at the three energies that I mentioned um, in the other maps. Uh, so this is all at one state of charge at the very end of the third charge. Um, this one was quite interesting because we see a decrease in capacity, which is not unexpected. Um, but we also, on this final charge, see that the electrode structure has completely changed. We had that, uh, the discontinuities and the changes, but then there was a recovery at the end of the first cycle. Um, by the end of the third cycle, um, we've basically lost quite a bit of the sulfur intensity, um, and we also have residual polysulfide intensity uh, in those sort of uh, chunks in the middle of the electrode. Um, so this leads me to believe that we've had significant morphological changes in the sulfur electrode, um, but also that we have some residual polysulfides, which um, is something we would expect given our knowledge of the polysulfide shuttle effect. Um, so these maps were quite surprising uh, to see exactly how much the structure had changed um, at the end of the third cycle. So in conclusion, uh, I was able to observe uh, changes in sulfur speciation um, in a cross-sectional pouch cell and an operando in situ cell. Uh, I achieved a capacity of 2470 milliamp hours per gram sulfur uh, in the operando geometry. Um, and then I was able to see evolution of the structure uh, both in the electrode and in the diffusion uh, at the interface as well. So as I mentioned, uh, this is still sort of a work in progress, this hot off the press data. Um, so there are several future directions and uh, avenues I can follow, including improving the uh, chemistry of the cell and the cell design. The thing that I'm going to be focusing on mainly is optimizing my data collection so that I can get the maximum information at the fastest time scale. So this can be done using asymmetric pixels, a smaller mapping size, shorter dwell times, and I'm working with the beamline scientist uh, quite closely to, to figure out what the best way to do that is. And then also moving forward, this analysis was mostly qualitative. Uh, I hope to do some quantitative analysis uh, using standards and spectral fitting uh, going forward. Um, as you can imagine, this takes a whole team. Uh, my research group, Tony Research Group at, at SSRL is great. Um, speci specifically, um, my advisor, Mike Tony, obviously, and Robert Cassie, who is a graduate student at Stanford, Chloe Heath, who is a summer student who worked with me on a lot of the offline testing uh, in the initial stages. Uh, we collaborate with Brian Perdue at Sandia National Labs and Yuri Nakayama and Daisuke Mori at Sony Corporation, who had uh, a lot of input uh, and great advice in this project. Uh, Sam and Courtney are the beamline scientists at 14.3, and Doug Van Campen uh, helped me design the operando cell uh, in its many iterations. Uh, we have financial support from Jay Caesar and Sony, um, and then this is our group down at the bottom on a beautiful sunny day in Menlo Park. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Um, we have time to take a few questions from the audience. 
Uh, Professor Wu, uh, could you wait for the mic, please? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Professor Zhang, yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. I noticed the voltage platform for is around 2 and 1.8 yes. in your battery. Yes. And also the salt is uh, lithium chloride oxide, mm -hmm. not uh, LITFSI. Yes. So why do you choose this system? And also the capacity is a bit low. So, sure. So what's the reason to choose this system? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I chose the lithium perchlorate salt um, because I did some of my initial tests with the LITFSI salt. Um, and because of the S double bonded to the oxygen, you get this huge signal at 2480. Um, so that basically swamps out any signal that you would really want to look at based on the intensity. So the perchlorate eliminates that signal. So any changes I actually see are due to the binder, um, because that's where the LITFSI is, or from the electrode. So that's the, the main reason for that. Um, the voltage plateaus are low. This is true. Um, I think a lot of this, um, depending on how your, your salt and your solvent or in your electrolyte interact, those can change a bit. Um, I'm still trying to figure out exactly if that's completely due to that or if there are some other issues in the cell. Um, and also due to the capacity. Um, so one of the things that I'm working on optimizing in the next, uh, I guess this was beta, so I guess gamma iteration of the operando cell. Um, so I'm using the screws as the current collectors right now. And even though I'm trying to apply as uniform a pressure as I can to the electrodes, there's likely some, uh, some areas that are not as well in contact as they should be. Um, so moving forward, I'm gonna try to put either some sort of plate or some other uh, probably mechanical mechanism to try to try to get better contact and hopefully that will help uh, up the sulfur utilization and the capacity. Um, just a comment, the combination of lithium perchloride, sulfur and carbon, it's quite a dangerous system. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I noticed that the, uh, the absorption edge energy of the polysulfide is on the lower energy than both uh, either Li2S or S0. So uh, I thought that the, uh, the absorption edges uh, should be at the between these two. You, you notice that? I, I know there are standard spectrum, but just curious, do you know the reason why the absorption edge is not in between those two species rather than at much lower potential? Uh, yeah. So, so there are several features in the the polysulfide spectra. Um, I've done some some work with standards, which is what I'll be using for the the fitting. So there's several features, um, but because the sulfur feature is primarily at that white line, the polysulfide pre-edge feature is a really good way to distinguish that. So the oxidation state um, or of the sulfur goes from two minus one minus and up through six plus. So when you have the polysulfides, you have those. Um, lower oxidation states, so that's why those features appear there. Um, the polysulfide pre-edge feature also uh, correlates to the sulfur, um, the polysulfide species that you have, so the intensity of that pre-edge feature um, tracks with if you have Li2S8, Li2S4, that kind of thing, so it's also another good uh, metric for what polysulfides you have. Okay. okay uh in the interest of time, let's bring for the questions to the uh, lunch and dinner. Let's thank uh, Elizabeth again for the interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Professor De Yang Chu from University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Uh, he will talk, talk about investigation of sulfur redox re uh, reaction mechanism by the quantitative and qualitative measurements of dissolved polysulfide.